It's finally here. Hello everyone and welcome back to Real History. I am your host, history professor Jared Frederick, and I'm very pleased to be checking out the brand new trailer, the long-awaited, long-anticipated, long-anguishing trailer for Apple TV's forthcoming miniseries, Masters of the Air. This is a project that has long been in the works, a long gestation period for well over a decade, it finally swung into production in 2019 and was beleaguered by a number of logistical setbacks, but it is here, it is imminent, and it will be released on Apple TV in January. And I thought it entirely appropriate that we could take a look at the brand new teaser trailer, and I might be able to offer some historical commentary along the way. So, without further ado, Let's take a look at the first trailer for Masters of the Air. When you look at it, very ominous you beginning. Pay attention to what's really going on. It's kind of beautiful. Ah, uh, yes. We came from every corner of the country with a common purpose. Go, 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 go. To bring the war to Hitler's doorstep. Oh wow, look at the formations there. Oh these daylight missions. The suicide. <laughs> oh man. Come on, just move. A little bit of everything in this, man. Even if the odds are stacked against us. First time in the sawmill, boys. Let's rack them up and knock them down. <laughs> oh my, oh my, oh my. Woo! Wow. That was really stellar, and there is a lot to unpack in these opening scenes. This vista of the night sky as we see American airmen, presumably at their base, uh, looking up to the heavens and watching these tracer rounds go up into the air, very much reminds me of a conversation with a surviving World War II bomber pilot who I am very good friends with by the name of John Homan. I'll tell you a little bit more about him in just a little bit. But what he would say is that they would sit atop the roofs of their huts uh, not too far away from the coast of the North Sea, and they would watch German V-bombs, uh, 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 early sort of cruise missile, uh, perhaps destined for London in this case, and they would watch all of the British coastal batteries try to shoot them down at night. And maybe, just maybe, that is what we see happening here in these scenes. And he said it was uh, an unbelievable fireworks show, and he was glad he was not on the receiving end of a lot of that British coastal fire. We have an early reminder here that these are the same producers, Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks, and Gary Getzman, who are producing this, and this is sort of the end of the trifecta, perhaps, uh, the, the final bookend of the trilogy. And there's a certain degree of danger in all of this, cinematically speaking, because expectations are so high for this series 
uh, Band of Brothers and the Pacific, although very different films, took the genre of the war film to an entirely different level. And if this one doesn't meet those same expectations, if this one doesn't reach that same caliber of filmmaking and storytelling, the fans will never forgive them. I have trust though, because it is the same screenwriter, one of the same screenwriters by the name of John Orloff, who wrote some of the best episodes in Band of Brothers. So I have a high degree of hope and optimism that he will pull through for us. It's interesting because if you watch the trailer with the subtitles, the person who is described as narrating this uh, little bit of quotation here is Harry Crosby. And Harry Crosby is a very important figure in the history of the 100th Bomb Group, which is the focus of this series. Because it just so happens that Harry Crosby wrote this book, which is entitled A Wing and a Prayer. And if you want some really good reading material to prepare you for Masters of the Air, this is the one to read. In some way, Harry Crosby, who was a navigator on a B-17 and survived something like 30 missions over Nazi-occupied territory, in some ways, he's the Dick Winters of the story. Now, he may not be the sort of standout, stoical, heroic figure uh, that is the main character, but... What he does have in common with Dick Winters is that he kept track of the stories. He kept record of all of this, and he often did so at reunions and through his own research and writings in the years after the war. This book, I sense, is going to be at the heart of this story. So there you go. A little bit of homework for you until the series comes out. The description of taking the war to Hitler's doorstep is very accurate in this regard. And the United States Army Air Forces would often bomb enemy positions by day while our British counterparts did so by night. This was often referred to as round-the-clock bombing. And interestingly enough, I watched recently the Netflix series All the Light We Cannot See, and it opens up with a squadron of B-24 bombers <laughs> bombing at night, which was not the norm. That would have most definitely been the exception. And in these shots, we see the feared Flak 88. This was an all-purpose weapon for the Germans during the Second World War. It had been developed in the 1930s. It could knock out the armor on a tank. It could be used as an anti-personnel weapon on the ground level, and it also had the capacity to lob a high explosive shell something like four miles into the sky. We also notice in the accompanying shots these black puffs of smoke that are erupting around the American aircraft. These are the flak explosions. And my good World War II veteran friend, John Homan, said that if you saw these black puffs of smoke in the distance, you were not in split-second danger. However, as those explosions came closer, if you could see the red burst of explosive at the core of that explosion, that blast, he said, that is when you knew you were really in trouble. One of the really incredible things about this style of aerial combat is the fact that you might have some heavy bombers that might be moving at 200, 250 miles an hour, and then you have German aircraft coming at them at 400 miles an hour, perhaps. That means that there is a closing speed of 600 miles per hour. And for men who were in the cockpit, they could see the swarm of enemy looming in the far distance, but in the bat of an eye, they could be gone. Uh, that is how rapid that this manner of combat was. And it was truly terrifying stuff. Some overly cynical individuals made early criticism about some of the, the still shots and early footage regarding Masters of the Air because there is the presence of African-American pilots shown. And what this is, from what I can gather, is that uh, these pilots, Tuskegee Airmen, and we see their, their red tail and nose uh, in a later shot, uh, these were men who lived the same existence in captivity as many of the men in the 100th bomb group. Uh, there were men from the 100th, 
as well as the Tuskegee Airmen who were in the likes of Stalag Luft 3 and Stalag 7A. Uh, and what this does is that this shows us another element of the war, dare I say another theater of the war as well, while not straying too far away from the experiences of the main characters. And that is the beauty of showing something like a prisoner of war camp depiction, uh, which I think this series is going to dwell quite heavily upon. To learn more about the POW experience, especially in regard to the 100th Bomb Group, I highly encourage you to read this relatively new book by World War II veteran Frank Murphy, which is entitled Luck of the Draw, My Story of the Air War in Europe. Uh, this gentleman, too, is a character in Masters of the Air. It is a very good book. It is insightful about the POW experience. This is another one that you want to put on your list in preparation for Masters of the Air. So there we have it. Some initial thoughts on this rather exhilarating first trailer for Masters of the Air. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't suggest to you some of the source material that goes along with this series. Donald Miller's Masters of the Air, my copy here, is autographed. Uh, that serves as some really foundational narrative for the series. However, only a small portion of the book actually focuses on the 100th Bomb Group. If you want, however, an overall comprehensive history of the 8th Air Force in the Second World War, this is definitely the one that you want to read. And last but not least, I'd like to reintroduce you to my good friend, John Homan. Over the past year and a half, John and I, and John is now approaching 100 years old, teamed up to co-write his memoirs. Uh, that book is now available for order, and it is entitled Into the Cold Blue, My World War II Journeys with the Mighty 8th Air Force. And many of the stories that I just imparted to you were told firsthand from him to me. And I hope to explore a lot more of those experiences, the daily lives, routines, perils, hazards, and fears of men in the mighty 8th Air Force. And hopefully we can do that by using John's very personal, heroic, sometimes humorous story as a vehicle for doing just that. So I welcome you to follow the link below and order the book. I don't think you're going to be disappointed. That wraps up this special episode of Real History. As always, we invite you to hit that subscribe button below. Also feel free to visit our website and check out the many great learning and educational resources we have available on our website. If you like our channel, if you like what we do, you can also visit our t-shirt store linked below. And of course, we always welcome donations via Patreon. Any form of support is always welcome. But the first thing you want to do is hit that subscribe button, make a comment below, and to all of our new visitors, welcome aboard. Until we see you next time on Real History, stay curious.